catalyzes the disorder of the esophagus, which is essentially the, the muscular tube that conveys the food from the mouth to the stomach. So this tube has, uh, has uh, two important functions. One is to propel the food from the mouth to the, to the stomach. And how does it do that? It, uh, it uh, generates a wave of muscular contraction that runs from the top of the esophagus to the end of the esophagus where it meets the stomach and, and, and squeezes the food balls down until it enters the stomach. The second function is uh, it has a barrier between the, the, the main body of the esophagus and the stomach. This barrier is located, um, if you can see over here, right in the junction here between the stomach and the, and the esophagus. You can see this fleshy muscular tube, the esophagus, which is what brings the food down. And then this uh, sphincter, which is a circular muscle, is, is essentially the gatekeeper that opens to let the food through. And uh, when it functions properly, it prevents then food or acidic contents of the esophagus from uh, squirting back into the esophagus and causing heartburn or reflux related symptoms. So when the, when this sphincter functions normally, it lets the food through but prevents, but then contracts and prevents stomach contents from going back into the esophagus. Essentially, there is um, this function of the muscle of the esophagus. And this consists of essentially two main issues. Number one, the, the, the contraction of this part of the muscle, which, which happens sequentially as a wave and, and pushes the foot down, is dysfunctional. It, uh, the esophagus doesn't contract in a sequential way to push the foot down. So that, that, uh, the, 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 the medical term for that is uh, aperistalsis which is again like achalasia, it's from the Greek, a means not to have. So a peristalsis means you don't have peristalsis, which is the, the propulsion of the food. And then you also, the second feature is, which gives the disorder its name, is the lack of relaxation. This sphincter here, the circular muscle, you can see the thickening here in the muscle, that is normally closed, preventing gastric contents from going backwards and letting the food through, doesn't relax properly. Normally there are these nerves that run along the esophagus that when you put food in your, in your mouth and start trying to swallow it, they give a signal down to the sphincter that food is arriving and it's timed, there's a reflex that is properly timed so as the food is coming down, the, the sphincter relaxes to get it through. So this reflex is not functional in achalasia. So food is coming through, but the signal to relax does not uh, operate. So the food finds a closed sphincter, which does not relax and starts accumulating in the esophagus. And the, the classic symptom for, for achalasia that patients tell you is uh, that um, they feel that the food gets stuck and they often need to consume large amounts of uh, liquid or water, which as, as, the, as the water accumulates in the esophagus, it increases the, the pressure, the, the, the hydrostatic pressure, until it reaches a pressure level similar to what pressure the, the sphincter exerts. And when that gets exceeded, the, finally the, the food gets flushed through. Let's discuss the evaluation of patients with suspected achalasia. The first part of the evaluation involves a very simple test that has been around for decades, which is um, having the patient swallow a uh, white liquid that is uh, visible on x-ray. It's very dense, it contains uh, element barium. Uh, so the, the test is called the barium swallow, and then taking x-ray pictures to um, sequentially to follow the movement of this barium that was followed uh, across the esophagus and see if there are any areas where there may be uh, partial or complete obstruction to the flow of the, of the barium. 
the, the cardinal test for diagnosis of achalasia, which is required, is then to do a formal uh, testing of the muscle of the esophagus in terms of its contract contractility and relaxation using a special test that, it's co that is called uh, uh, esophageal manometry. Well, the, the, the way this test is done is a, is a special um, small catheter is introduced from the nose uh, down the esophagus until it enters the stomach. And then the catheter is positioned properly to measure the pressure with which the muscle is squeezing all along the esophagus. Right now there are a number of treatment options. The two main ones that have traditionally been used for achalasia are balloon dilation and disruption of the sphincter by basically inflating a balloon across it and tearing it. And a surgical option which involves a surgeon going in the abdomen, finding the sphincter of the esophagus and using a, a, some sort of scalpel incising the sphincter. There has been a recent study that was of high enough quality and, uh, and involving a large number of patients to uh, be published in the New England Journal of Medicine which reviewed the efficacy of uh, balloon dilation versus surgery. So that the results indicated that the two methods were equally effective. A new technique has been developed that provides advantages of surgery but with much less invasiveness. Uh, this technique is called peroral, that means through the mouth, endoscopic myotomy instead of surgical myotomy. So it, it, the acronym is very nice, it's, uh, it spells POEM. Uh, so, and that, uh, that is the, the new technique that is making waves now in the field of achalasia. It uh, was invented in Japan in 2009. Uh, we performed the first human case at Winthrop uh, approximately um, 10 to 12 months after the, the, uh, the first Japanese case. Uh, in uh, October of 2009 and we were the first center in the US to uh, perform this technique and we are still only one of a handful of centers in the world that uh, performed this technique and uh, we're probably also the first patient <coughs> the first center to perform this technique uh, outside uh, of Japan and uh, we had the publication on the first patient on whom th we performed the technique and who did uh, tremendously well in um, in the the the, the main uh, endoscopic journal in the United States and one of the probably the preeminent endoscopic journal in the world. The way that the technique works is we introduce the endoscope in the esophagus. We use a saline injection to inject. Uh, saline between uh, the, the, the wall of the esophagus is composed of three main layers. The lining of the esophagus, the muscle layer, which is the outermost layer, and in between the lining and the muscle layer, there is this, this, level, this layer that is called the submucosa, mucosa being the lining, which contains blood vessels, nerves, it's a, it's a very loose layer, and generally it's, it's very thin but once a needle is inserted through the lining into this layer and, and saline is injected, we expand this layer to up to a centimeter or two in thickness. And that creates a space that we can operate in. So this is a very novel approach. This is the only endoscopic technique where this uh, space is used to perform endoscopic surgery right now in any significant scale. So what happens is after this space is created, a small hole is made in the lining and dilated with a, with, a, with a tiny balloon and that allows the endoscope to then enter into this, uh, you can think of it as a crawl space between the lining and the muscle of the esophagus. And then the uh, scope is advanced uh, down the esophagus in this, in this submucosal space until the sphincter is encountered. 
then it's incised with a, with a small electrical knife, the way a surgeon would do it from the outside of the esophagus. And once the complete incision is achieved, the endoscope is removed from the tunnel, and the small round entry to the tunnel is closed with special little endoscopic clips. You can think of them as tiny staples that we can put to the endoscope that then fall out by themselves, uh, usually in a, in a month or two. So what this technique achieves is um, by creating this tunnel, there is, there is increased safety. So, so as the sphincter is incised, even if the incision goes through and through and perforates the esophagus, there is a mucosa layer that then uh, falls, when the scope was removed, falls as a flap and seals this entire tunnel, including the cut into the muscle. So it's a, it's a special technique that ensures a safe uh, incision of the muscle of the esophagus. What are the potential advantages of this kind of endoscopic myotomy compared to the surgical myotomy? There is the obvious advantage of no scars, which potentially means less wound infections. Another thing we have seen in our patients that we have done is essentially none to minimal pain. Uh, most of our patients have not required any narcotics or other pain medications after this uh, uh, sort of endoscopic myotomy. But the initial data, we have so very good data in, in terms of decreased reflux than one would expect uh, compared to what happens in the, in, in the surgical uh, Heller myotomy. Also, it does not preclude uh, balloon dilation after this is performed. After the procedure is performed, the patient is moved to the recovery room. Currently, we do perform the procedure in the operating room because we are early in our experience. So in case something that occurs that requires a surgical intervention, uh, we want to be ready for this to occur within minutes. Uh, so it is performed the hour. The patient is recovered in the recovery room and then is transferred to a floor. And you, in most patients, we are able to discharge them the following day uh, in the afternoon after a barium swallow procedure is performed in the morning to make sure that there's no perforation. Many patients are interested to know what the diet will be after the procedure. Uh, they many want to go straight to a steak that uh, is not allowed for a short period of time. For the first two weeks, uh, our normal protocol is to uh, maintain the patients in a, on a, still on a liquid diet as most of them are actually before they come for the procedure because of the severity of the dysphagia that achalasia causes. So we tell them to maintain their liquid diet for another two weeks approximately because the, the procedure of the myotum itself, even though it ablates the sphincter, it causes tissue swelling from the injury to the tissue caused by the surgery. And the tissue swelling itself may cause some degree of obstruction. So we basically maintain the diet until all the swelling from the from the uh, uh, cutting of the sphincter resolves. So for two weeks, we uh, ask the patients to maintain their liquid diet, and then we liberalize the diet after that to uh, to a solid diet. So usually, uh, two to three months after the procedure, we repeat uh, a score of symptoms, which quantifies those symptoms. And we uh, selectively, we, we may perform a, another barium swallow examination to make sure that that bird beak of the non-relaxing sphincter has resolved and there's ample movement of uh, barium into the stomach. And we may repeat the manometry to document the effectiveness of the procedure in, in eliminating the high pressure of the sphincter. From then on, usually then every six months or so, we perform the, the symptom score. Again, to detect early any relapse that can be easily treated with a uh, salvage technique as balloon dilation before there's any risk of getting a dilated esophagus that uh, may require extensive surgery to eliminate. For more information about achalasia, uh, visit winthrop.org or call 1866 Winthrop.